Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I am Michael Mitchell, Project Manager of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. This is now the sixth and final webinar of our series building up to COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. <clears throat> today, we will discuss open issues at COP26, Article 6 and transparency, and critical steps towards a successful conference. If you have any questions during the interview, please use the raise hand option at the bottom of your screen and put them or put them in the chat and we'll address them at the appropriate time. Please be advised this will be recorded for future training use. <clears throat> All the webinars in this series have provided a past to present timeline of where climate science and climate policy began, how they integrated, then leading up to where we stand now with both. All of this to bring awareness of the importance of the upcoming COP26 and the decisions that come out of it. I'm joined here today by Leo Masai, Senior Policy Expert at Coalition for Rainforest Nations and Associate Professor of International Environmental Law at the Catholic University of Lille. Leo, it's great to have you back again. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. And I do hope that uh, this is going to be a useful webinar as the past ones, uh, especially for those are going to attend COP26, and of course also anyone else who is interested on the matter. So now, Leo, not only do we know how important this COP is because of the latest science report coming out of the IPCC, but also because we missed a crucial year, right? Yes, exactly. For the first time since uh, its establishment, the UNFCCC COP did not take place last year in 2020 despite of it to be scheduled on a yearly basis. As we all know, this was due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which set back expectations from civil society, media, and all stakeholders. So we are all very much looking forward to, to continue the negotiation process uh, in Glasgow in a few days. Actually, uh, we had the counter example in the history of the COPs, uh, when uh, uh, COP6 was held uh, twice in the range of six months. Actually, COP6 in The Hague did not conclude the work because of the lack of agreement in December 2000, and that was adjourned to the summer of 2001 when COP6 bis was held. And apart from those two examples, COPs are happening every year since 1994, which is the first COP in Buenos Aires when the convention entered into force. And you touched on this during the policy webinar of this of the series previously, but explain to us again, what is the function of COP? Uh, yes, sure. So as established practice, the COP is taking place uh, towards the end of the year and COP26 is the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Climate Change Convention. But it's also the place uh, where additional bodies will meet. So to be precise and correct, we should refer to the UN Climate Change Conference that will happen in Glasgow between the 31st of October and the 12th of November 2001, 2021 as the umbrella where all different bodies established under the climate regime will meet. And those bodies are COP26, indeed, uh, the Conference of the Parties for the Convention, CMP16, which is the Conference of the Parties under the Kyoto Protocol, and CMA3, which is uh, the Conference of the Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the agreement uh, under the Paris Agreement. And in addition to those three bodies, we'll also have, uh, we're going to have the meetings of the permanent subsidiary bodies, notably uh, SBI and SABSTA. Um, as we may know, the most relevant difference among those bodies is on parties' participation and obviously also on the mandate. So on participation, uh, for example, while in the CMP, the United States have an observer status, in the COP and the CMA, they are full members uh, since they are a party to the, to the Convention and to the Paris Agreement. On this topic, it's also important to remember and welcome the ratification of the Paris Agreement by Turkey that just arrived a few days ago. And now the Paris Agreement is really missing only a handful of countries. And it's embraced and accepted and welcomed by the international community. Uh, on the issue of the mandate, the COP deals with matters related with the implementation of the Convention. The CMP deals with matters related with the Kyoto Protocol and the CMA deals with matters related with the Paris Agreement. Um, so to be formally correct, we should make reference to the different meetings depending on which topics and issues we speak about. For practical reasons, everyone just refers to COP26 as the meeting where all bodies under the existing climate regime 
are going to meet uh, in a few days. So Leo, um, tell us now, what can we expect? What's on the menu for this upcoming conference? Yeah, sure, Michael, uh, a very, very dense menu. The Glasgow meeting uh, follows almost two years of online and virtual meetings. This is also a novelty in the history of the COPs, of course. Uh, uh, online meetings such as the Climate Change Dialogue of November 2020, which discussed, amongst others, matters related with mitigation, ambition, adaptation, market mechanisms, and global stock take. Or the three weeks uh, of virtual uh, session in May, June 2021, where the SBI and the SABSTA could slightly advance their work by producing a package of informal notes that will allow parties to advance the negotiations uh, once in Glasgow. So COP26 will open on Sunday, the 31st of October. And that's also very unusual, as all previous COPs opened on Monday of week one. Uh, so Sunday, 31st of October, the plenary of all bodies will open, where statements will be read. This will be followed by the usual high-level segment, where heads of state and government, just a few, and ministers, the overwhelming majority, will try to give the political direction which is needed to all delegations and highlight the key steps to have a successful summit. Uh, and the high-level segment will be two days, 1st and 2nd of November. Following the high-level segment, negotiations at the technical level will be non-stop until the end of week two. If needed, ministers will come back towards the beginning of week two to unlock crunch political issues. This is the, the standard practice. So, and what types of discussions exactly will be taking place? Yeah, just, just uh, let's dive into it. Uh, to make our life easier, I would divide the focus of the discussion that is going to be held in Glasgow in two main sections. So part one is about what is needed to be agreed to finalize the Paris rulebook. In other words, the operational rules for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So the main objective of CMA3 is to finalize the following three missing pieces that parties haven't cleared since Katowice in 2018. And those three uh, pieces are common timeframes, so the implementation periods that would be applicable to all parties nationally determine contributions, NDCs, the rules for the implementation of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, the new carbon market mechanism, and third, the missing elements enhanced, uh, on the enhanced transparency framework. Uh, in part two, we will consider any other topic still needed to achieve the main goals and objectives of the new climate regime. Uh, and you mentioned Catalyst. Remind us again what came out of that. Yes, exactly. Katowice is a very important milestone. That, is, that was 2018, 2018, and CMA concluded its first session, CMA 1. Uh, and this was possible since the Paris Agreement entered into force in November 2016 and adopted a package of key decisions as mandated by the Paris Agreement. So the Katowice package of decisions is including a lot of rules, a lot of different decisions, amongst others, the guidance on NDCs like the features of NDCs, uh, a decision about information to facilitate clarity, transparency, and understanding of NDCs, a decision on accounting for parties NDCs, uh, a decision on adaptation communication, uh, another important decision about the rules, so-called modalities, procedures, and guidelines for the transparency framework for action and support, um, a decision important, a very important decision on the global stock take. And finally, the decision about the rules for uh, the committee to facilitate the implementation and promote compliance. Uh, following Katowice, parties met in Madrid for uh, COP25 the Ch the Chile, under the Chile presidency, where on the above elements, negotiations could not progress any further and just stalled. Thank you for that brief reminder there. So please now proceed with the goals of COP26. Yes, uh, Michael, sure. So the, the as the July ministerial meeting confirmed, the completion of the Paris rulebook is vital for the integrity, credibility and ambition of the whole regime. So the SBI and the SAFSTA are expected to work nonstop on the three items identified above and forward a clean draft decision to CMA3 for its adoption. So we are expecting a lot of uh, uh, days and nights of negotiation on those three main elements. And let's remind them in more details uh, now. 
very briefly. So Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement, talking about and introducing the three carbon market, uh, sorry, two carbon market mechanism and one non-carbon market approach mechanism. That is uh, uh, regulated and negotiated under the SABSTA. And parties uh, have uh, progressed uh, during the last months, but there are still differences, very important differences among them on the elements. The first one is a share of proceeds for 6.2 approaches to be delivered at the same level than under Article 6.4. So there is a, a share of the proceeds that will come out of the sale of carbon units that is supposed to go to the adaptation fund, to fund um, adaptation for developing countries. And that's a key transition still not clarified. Uh, so how another uh, important uh, uh, topic is how both 6.2 and 6.4 are going to deliver on uh, OMGE, which is the overall mitigation in global emissions. So the system, the mechanism to make sure that the new market-based mechanism will also deliver in terms of environmental integrity. Um, so another important element where there is still divergence is the CDM transition. How we're going to deal with the CDM activities and units, so-called CERs, Certified Emission Reductions, that are coming from the Kyoto Protocol CDM world and that have been uh, have already happened. So how are we going to treat them in the new regime under the Paris Agreement? Another element of uh, uh, discussion is the institutional arrangements around the non-market-based framework under 6.8. Another element is approaches to set the baseline. So the baseline and the reference emission levels and principles for 64, which I'm uh, just reminding everyone, is the project-based mechanism uh, established under the Paris Agreement. And then finally, we also have um, three more issues which are still very much pending. So one is the, how we're going to deal with the non-GIG metrics, so metrics which are different from greenhouse gases, uh, the safeguards and the limits for the use of ITMOS, internationally transfer mitigation outcomes that uh, are regulated under Article 6.2. And finally, how we're going to treat ITMOS, so mitigation outcomes for uh, other mitigation purposes. So a very, very dense menu that will uh, will uh, be very challenging to be concluded and will put uh, negotiators uh, uh, in a very, very important position in Glasgow. Absolutely. And just as an FYI for those where, you know, obviously we're digging deep into the Paris Agreement. If anyone missed the previous webinar of Leo going through that, uh, please feel free to reach out to me for that recording, or again, ask your questions if you have any while we go. So thank you, go ahead, Leo. Yes, indeed, that's a good reminder, Michael, we are uh, dealing with a lot of technical issues, so uh, please do not hesitate to ask also questions in the chat uh, if you have any. Um, uh, so just to conclude on Article 6, uh, we have the uh, latest news, which is uh, this week, uh, the Secretariat and the SB and the SABSA chair just shared an informal options paper which uh, is dated 18 of October. And this paper is going to capture the results of the informal technical expert dialogues uh, held uh, uh, in 2021 and discussions held under the informal ministerial track. So this paper is just being released by the SABSTA chair and uh, is going to help countries and delegations to address the different issues when starting the negotiations in, uh, in Glasgow. Um, I see there is a, a, a question about ITMOS. Yes. Because uh, what is the meaning of that? Uh, so with ITMOS, we refer to internationally transfer mitigation outcomes. And that's the language used by the Paris Agreement uh, for uh, uh, Article 6.2, the new mechanism that is regulated under, under Article 6.2. So the Paris Agreement is giving the possibility to countries, to parties, to exchange with each other ITMOS, so mitigation outcomes, which are usually um, by most of the people uh, um, understood as uh, tons of CO2 of, of emission reduction or removal. So that's a possibility for parties under the Paris Agreement to exchange mitigation outcomes on different sectors to meet their targets under the NDCs. This is just a possibility given by the Paris Agreement to, to parties to meet their commitments. And that's a very similar system to what we had uh, in the Kyoto Protocol and it was called um, emissions trading. Um, so let's move into transparency. Um, on transparency, which is also an item addressed by the SABSTA, 
uh, a very technical item again. Countries got really apart a COP25 in Madrid when there was no agreement at all. The main problem there and still is the division between developed country parties and big committers within developing countries. The former requiring to stick on the mandate of the Paris Agreement and oppose to any concession in terms of provision of finance, capacity building and flexibility to others. And the latter, the developing countries are attempting to stretch out a little bit the discussion and reduce the burden countries have on reporting under the new transparency framework. So there is still a, a big difference between those positions. And therefore, uh, on transparency in Glasgow, delegations will be called to agree on several uh, missing elements of the transparency framework, including the common formats and tables that the parties will have to use to report about their level of greenhouse gas emissions, but also, also, but also common information uh, that parties will need to track progress in implementing and achieving NDCs, and especially to report on financial, technology development and transfer, and capacity building support needed and received. Um, and a lot of technicality that to be agreed in a very little time. And on finally, the third big element of the Paris rule book, which is still missing, is the common time frames that is discussed under the SBI. And there we have mainly three options on the table. We are talking about common time frames for measuring uh, the commitments of parties under the NDCs. At the moment, parties are free to choose any any time frame. Uh, but the options on the table uh, are trying to, to get to a common understanding so that it would be easier to measure and compare one country to another. So the, we have three options mainly on the table. The first one is a five-year time frame, which is fully in line with the ambition mechanism established by the Paris Agreement. Uh, the second option is a five plus five option with a 10-year time frame updated uh, five years. And the third option is a 10-year time frame. These options uh, imply uh, a lot of differences uh, which are related with the, with the extent of the efforts that parties are going are gonna to take. And for some countries, there are also some linkages to national processes for uh, uh, policy decisions on climate change. So there are a lot of implications there uh, and um, parties are still uh, uh, distant on this, on this topic. All right. And now uh, tell us what other topics will be addressed at COP. Yes, let's touch very briefly also the part two that I was mentioning just before. And there are several important issues uh, on the menu for Glasgow. I'm just going to mention a few, uh, not all of them, uh, um, uh, given the little time that we have. So under the CMP, for example, which is the body, the, the, the supreme body of the Kyoto Protocol, parties are expected to take a very important decision on the future of the Kyoto Protocol, in particular on the destiny of uh, uh, the established mechanisms such as the CDM and others, including how we're going to treat uh, uh, the units and the activities that have been already generated, but also how we're going to deal with the institutions that have been created under the, the Kyoto Protocol regime. So under the KP, we need a clear decision uh, by the CMP to provide the clarity on the future of the Kyoto Protocol mechanism. Other several key issues will be addressed by other different bodies, mainly all uh, under the framework and the umbrella of the COP, COP26. Uh, and there are here three main uh, clusters. The first one is mitigation and ambition. We all know the IPCC just told us that uh, we need to do more, much more. So COP26 will engage in the uh, discussion around uh, responding to any gap in the 2030 ambition, exploring also the proposal for a roadmap. This came up out by the July ministerial roadmap towards keeping the 1.5 degrees in reach, how to make sure that NDCs are aligned to 1.5, all aligned together uh, towards this uh, very important objective. Also discussing the long-term strategies on climate change, uh, looking at the net zero by 2050, and then we'll also cover uh, the issue of the NDC update and revision towards the, the 2050 timeframe. Outside of the NDCs and the strictly speaking Paris Agreement regime, uh, there's also a discussion around the second periodic review of the UNFCCC goal. The UNFCCC has a long-term global goal uh, to stabilize uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And then finally also um, the preparation of technical 
phase of the first global stock take that will take place uh, in uh, in 2023. I see questions about the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, can the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol end? Um, of course it can, but that has to be decided by the CMP. So the Kyoto Protocol, like the Paris Agreement and the Convention, has no deadline. It's an international treaty established by uh, parties, sovereign states, and it can only terminate and end if parties, um, so government states, uh, sovereign states and government decide that. So uh, the Kyoto Protocol will be ended only if parties are going to decide that under the CMP. Uh, at the moment, we are not sure what will be the decision of the CMP in Glasgow, but we can rule out that at some point uh, the Kyoto Protocol will cease to exist, uh, given the Paris Agreement is a natural uh, uh, form, uh, is a successor. But at the moment, the Kyoto Protocol is still in force and it, continue, it will continue to be in force uh, until the moment that parties will decide uh, otherwise under the CMP. So the second big cluster uh, that will be dealt by COP26 is on finance. And uh, we all uh, have to remember that in terms of climate finance, we are still uh, uh, fighting uh, against reaching the, the global goal on finance that was agreed in Copenhagen, uh, which is the 100 the US dollar billion per year to be mobilized. So in COP26, there will be discussion about the plan for setting the new collective quantified goal, which is not yet established. Uh, also, we'll be looking at how developed countries can mobilize uh, the finance needed to reach the 100 billion goal that I was just mentioning through through to 2025. Uh, and also, we'll look at uh, how much progress has been uh, uh, done so far in providing finance to developing countries according to that objective. Then there will be several other elements that will be uh, dealing with finance addressed by different bodies included the Standing Committee on Finance. There, there is a report on developing countries' needs. This will be discussed. The Green Climate Fund annual report uh, concerning access to finance will be also in the menu. The linkages between uh, the enhanced transparency framework of support and the discussion on finance is also very important. And then finally, there will be a review of the Adaptation Fund, which uh, just to remind everyone is the funding mechanism dedicated to adaptation, which was established in the Kyoto Protocol, and now, thanks to a CMA decision, is also serving the Paris Agreement. Uh, so finally, the last uh, cluster I wanted to, to raise here is the issue about adaptation and loss and damage so dear to many, many vulnerable countries. Um, in the Paris Agreement, there is a reference to a global goal on adaptation established under Article 9, but there is no yet uh, clear definition of that. So uh, what ministers decided in July was also to try to launch a roadmap to accelerate action towards that goal. Um, there will be also a decision on the package of adaptation finance that reflects the need to increase levels of and access to adaptation finance and achieve a better balance between mitigation and adaptation. And there will be, of course, a discussion on loss and damage, the mechanism which was established in Warsaw. Uh, and there, the July ministerial meeting uh, uh, launched the idea of a discussion paper uh, that was also finalized at the heads of delegation meeting that was held on loss and damage in August this year. In terms of adaptation, loss and damage, also other important topics that will be addressed by the substance the SBI is the Nairobi work program on impacts, vulnerability and adaptation to climate change, the national adaptation plans issue, the activities related with the joint work on agriculture, so-called Coronivia, uh, the fourth review of the adaptation fund that I just mentioned, uh, the role and the mandate of the executive committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism, the VIM, for loss and damage, and uh, the recommendations to fund loss and damage that um, are supposed to come from the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, and the Standing Committee uh, on Finance. So, Michael and everyone, a lot a lot uh, of uh, uh, topics and, wow. and meet to be discussed. Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Michael. No, I just was agreeing with you. It's a lot, <laughs> a lot of topics to discuss for sure. Yes. Um, yeah, I just saw a question about why we are linking adaptation and loss and damage. Uh, I mean, formally under the Paris Agreement, there's no specific link. I was just linking those here just for uh, convenience and to, to simplicity. Uh, adaptation is uh, one specific article and loss and damage is another article under the Paris Agreement. Those are 
two different regimes, although they all uh, refer to uh, the importance of addressing uh, uh, how vulnerable countries are affected by climate change, but formally they are not connected. It was just a, a choice uh, that I took uh, on my own, uh, just uh, for uh, uh, for simplicity and clarity. But there are definitely two different items uh, under uh, under the process. Um, so to conclude, from my side, colleagues and friends, clearly COP26 is another key milestone uh, along the journey to a 1.5 world. So a lot of expectation on Glasgow, probably too many. We as a coalition for rainforest nations will be there as usual uh, to make sure that the interests of rainforest nations are, are defended and that the final pieces of the Paris Agreement puzzle are in the right place. And we also hope that all parties are gonna come there with the same spirit. Uh, we are confident that this process, although slow and sometimes very cumbersome, will uh, will finally deliver what is needed and expected uh, uh, by all. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Leo, for once again, walking us through these very sophisticated, complex policy topics uh, in an easy to understand way. It, it really helps me when you do, when you do that, uh, because as you say, they're just they're, they're extremely technical. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome again uh, Thelma Krug, Vice Chair of the IPCC and Senior Technical Expert for CFRN, who has led us on the journey of the climate science during the series uh, for just a brief maybe closing statement on where we are today and uh, what we are, are up against. Uh, hi, Thelma, are you there? <laughs> yes, I am here. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, so we are coming to the end of this, which I hope to be the first set of a series of webinars. And when we started this endeavor, uh, the idea was to communicate in a simple language what can be perceived as being very complex. So the split between myself and Leo uh, was not by chance. So I was, uh, because, you know, IPCC uh, doesn't really pre prescribe anything for uh, for the convention or for the policymakers. It provides the scientific information to help them to be informed about what science says. So we hope that the science on the table will lead the policymakers to get uh, to good decisions at the COP. As Leo said, and uh, yes, uh, congratulations for the presentation, Leo. Uh, uh, it, it's a much more complex world to be at the convention, possibly. IPCC is very complicated, but the, but the convention is much more complicated, uh, as, as Leo said. So there are many issues to be resolved over there. And I think that pursuing the 1.5 is still a goal that many countries want to, you know, to continue to pursue. Uh, they know from the last report that it's gonna be difficult, but I don't think that the governments want to give it up. And not to give it up means doing much more than we are doing globally at present. Yes. So I appreciate that the climate finance is going to be there. But anyway, Michael, it was a it was an excellent opportunity for us to really um, to really put together presentations which we think uh, brought pieces here and pieces there that can be helpful not only to those that will be at COP26 but those that are not there yet. I am not gonna be there. It is the first one I'm missing after COP7. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a pity. But anyway, I am crossing my fingers here and wishing all the best. And I'm sure that the coalition will really, as Leo said, really go for the best for the coalition countries as a whole. So I am absolutely sure about that. So with that, I, we have a lot of work to do. And I wish everyone uh, good luck in their endeavors. And we hope to start another series, possibly mm. after the COP. Who knows? Yes. <laughs> OK, definitely. so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. It was great having you and Leo. It's uh, just on a, uh, on the CFRN side. It's just to, you both really know this and you really help uh, helped me understand. And again, I hope everyone else did as well. Um, <laughs> So this concludes our six part webinar series on climate emergency where science meets policy. Uh, we've laid out 
the journey from where it all began and where we stand now, both on climate policy and the latest climate science. Now we're on to COP26 in Glasgow to make more changes to battle global warming. As I've said before, we're all in this together. Thank you for everyone for doing your part with that. Please feel free to reach out to us for further webinar ideas. We really want to help build awareness around any topics that you are interested in. That's what we're here for. So keep that in mind. Take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Uh, thanks again, Leo and Thelma. So we'll see you in Glasgow. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.